Number 568. Take a look at the words very carefully. The, the words are really wonderful here. So as we sing together, let's think about the words. Uh, yeah, let, let's go ahead and stand. Make me a captive, Lord, and then I shall be free. Force me to render up my sword, and I shall conquer me. I sink in life's alarms when by myself I stand. Imprison me within thine arms, and strong shall be my hand. My heart is weak and poor, till it a master find. It has no spring of action sure, it varies with the wine. It cannot freely move Till thou hast wrought its chain Enslave it with thy matchless love And death lest it shall reign My will is not my own Till thou hast made it thine If it would reach a monarch's throne It must its crown resign It only stands unbent Amid the clashing strife when on thy bosom it has lent and found in thee its life. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Can you hear me okay? All right. I hope everyone had a blessed week and now an opportunity to come here and fellowship and get our spiritual batteries recharged. Um, before I begin, I would like uh, to touch on a subject that's been kind of dominating our country this year, and that's the, the election. You know, I was in Korea for 11 years, and I missed uh, three cycles. And after going through this year, what a blessing that was. Oh my goodness, this election business um, is a little crazy, um, to say the least. You have people on one hand, that say, you know, it's your absolute duty to vote. And on the other hand, people are saying, you will be voting for the devil in pink or the devil in blue. So I was kind of on the fence. I was in the middle. Uh, you know, Pastor Moore spoke about it when he was here. And we all have our opinions. And ultimately, I feel whatever you do, it's, it's your business. It's uh, your conscience. You'll have to... Um, make up for it in your own mind. So what I decided to do, let me just grab the remote real quick. Um, I had at one point decided, you know what, I'm just, I'll vote, you know. Um, so I, I, I was going to do the mail-in one, so I put everything in the envelope. I had it sitting on my, my car seat, and I was going to do one of those drop-off centers. So th that morning, I don't know if if you also received an uh, email from Mark Kinjo. Anybody received that email about the spirit of prophecy? And, and so I read it. And I read it twice, actually. And my conscience 
changed. And this is what I did with my voting envelope. And I'm going to share with you a verse that really touched my heart. It was this one right here. The people of God are not to vote to place such men in office. For when they do this, they are partakers with them of the sins which they commit while in office. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't do that. I don't know the hearts of the people that are running. I don't know what they would do. And I, I did not want to be partakers with them. So that's what I did. Ultimately, um, your decision is your, your decision. Uh, but me personally, um, I, I decided to pass this time around. All right, let's start. I want to do a word association test with you. I'm going to show you a date, and you tell me what comes to mind. Hey. <laughs> Valentine's Day, very good. Okay, Cinco de Mayo. Oh, very good. Independence Day. Halloween. Halloween. You know what? I'm going to change your opinion about that. We do think about Halloween, but something very important happened on October 31st, 1517. Martin Luther nailed the 95 Thesis to the door and began a protest. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about Martin Luther today. But before we do, why don't we have a word of prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to join us. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this beautiful day that you have given us to come together and worship. It may be cold and rainy outside, but it is, is warm and inviting inside. Lord, please send your Holy Spirit to be with us as we receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So I'm just going to do a little backstory about Martin Luther. I don't know if you know much about him, but I, w I just want to share uh, a little bit about him and what he did. So Martin Luther, he um, was uh, born in the late 1400s, and he uh, went to college. He first got his um, degree. He was going to be a lawyer. But something happened to him one summer when he was going from his home. Uh, he's from Germany, from his home to where his college was. He was caught in a terrible storm. And what happened was it was raining and a bolt of lightning hit this tree right by him. So he dropped to his knees. It says here, a lightning bolt struck near him uh, as he was returning to school. Terrified, he cried out, help, St. Anne, I'll become a monk. Now, who's St. Anne? Does anybody know who St. Anne is? So this area of Germany um, and all of Germany is dominated by the Catholic Church. So according to the Catholic Church, St. Anne, or Anne, is the mother of the Virgin Mary. Now, where they got that name, I, I don't know. I, not in the Bible. But, so he cried out to the mother of the Virgin Mary, If you save me, I will become a monk. Do you think he was saved? <laughs> yes, he was. So, it's not, it's, so he made it through the storm, he, and true to his word, Martin Luther, the very next day, entered the monastery. So he entered uh, to become a monk. Now, how do you think his parents reacted to that? Yeah, they weren't happy. They were not happy. They had high hopes for Martin. They, he was going to be a lawyer. He was going to bring honor and do all these great things for the family. And true to his word, he, he joined the, the monastery, which... Um, where he was, you know, monks were not really looked at as, as highly. They were, you know, very poor. So Martin Luther studied. He threw himself into uh, being a monk. And this is one of his quotes. If any monk ever got to heaven by monkery, then I should have made it. So he did everything that a monk, he prayed, he did, you know, he did communion. He, he, he actually lived in great poverty. Martin Luther used to go and beg for alms to feed himself. So he was, um, you know, very uh, committed to what he had become. And he continued to study. 
he got his uh, degree in theology and things like that. You know, back then, the Bible, it wasn't in German, which Martin Luther was. It was only um, in Latin, so he had to learn that language. Um, so, in 1511, Martin Luther decided he was going to take a trip to Rome. He was going to go to the Vatican and visit the Pope. So as he was going down there, he would stay in different um, monasteries, and he started to, to see a pattern. Some of these monasteries were, were very nice. They had, the monks wore very nice clothes, and they kind of lived in luxury. I mean, Martin Luther is coming where he was, you know, trying to live in poverty, which represents the life of Christ, does it not? If you look at Jesus, did he own anything besides the clothes on his back? No, he didn't. So uh, Martin Luther tried to, to live like that. So he went there and he uh, made it to Rome and he was totally shocked by what he saw. He saw, uh, you know, gold everywhere. He saw so much luxury. In the book From Here to Forever, we're told at last he beheld in the distance the seven-hilled city. So Rome is built on seven hills. So he, he made his pilgrimage there. He prostrated himself upon the earth, exclaiming, Holy Rome, I salute you. So prostrating, he's, he got on his knees, and he was like, he made it. He was so happy. And, uh, but then things changed. Everywhere, scenes filled him with astonishment. This is not astonishment like, wow, that's awesome. It's astonishment like, I cannot believe what I'm seeing. Iniquity among the clergy, indecent jokes from the prelates, he was filled with horror at their profanity, even during Mass. He met dissipation, debauchery. No one can imagine, he wrote, what sins and infamous actions are committed in Rome. They are in the habit of saying, if there is a hell, Rome is built over it. So he went there, and his, he, it broke his heart. He just could not believe the way these people acted. You remember, Martin Luther was trying to walk with Christ. He was trying to do everything that the Bible taught him to do. And these people were just crazy. You know, it says here, Seven Hilled City. I don't know if you know this or not, but we live next to uh, a city also built on seven hills. And that is Seattle. And uh, I'm not going to say Seattle is built over hell, but, you know, uh, I'll leave that for your opinion. So, what happened is Martin Luther, he decided to go back into the Bible. And if you go with me to the precious promise. So Martin Luther, he returned back to Germany, to his church, and he was heartbroken. And it says here, um, when it appeared that all was lost, God raised up a friend for him. So Martin Luther went back home, and he, he was uh, not feeling, but God rose up a friend, his name was Stoppitz, and Open the word of God to Luther's mind. So even though Martin Luther was reading the Bible and doing these things, his friend uh, took him deeper into it um, and bade him look away from self and look to Jesus. Instead of torturing yourself on account of your sins, throw yourself into the Redeemer's arms. Trust in him, in the righteousness of his life, in the atonement of his death, the Son of God, became man to give you the assurance of divine favor. Love him who first loved you. His words made a deep impression on Luther's mind. Peace came to his troubled soul. So his friend helped him to understand the word of God better. And then we get to Romans 117. So this is the verse that completely changed Luther's mindset. And if you've had a conversion, like I've had a conversion, there's always that one verse that you read that just changes your life, that just changes your opinion about things. And that's what happened to Martin Luther. The just shall live by faith, Romans 1.17. He sprang to his feet and hastened from the place in shame and horror. So he read this and he left. The text never lost its power upon his soul. From that time, he saw more clearly than ever before the fallacy of trusting to human works for salvation and the necessity of constant faith in the merits of Christ. So he started to see his church, the way that they were offering salvation, is not the biblical way that uh, salvation is given. His eyes had been opened and were never again to be closed to the delusions of the papacy. So he was looking at these people that 
who professed to be a Christian, right? A Christian is a follower of Christ. And they were just doing things that were unbelievable to him. So he called them the delusions of the papacy. So he wasn't going to follow the way that they did. He was going to get into the Word of God and find out how we truly are saved. When he turned his face from Rome, he had turned away also in, his, in, in heart. And from that time, the separation grew wider until he severed all connection with the papal church. So ultimately, he decided that that particular church, the way they were doing things, is not the way he was going to do things. He was going to search for ultimate truth. And in fact, we get the term sola scriptura from Martin Luther. And what does sola scriptura mean? That's right. The Bible and the Bible alone. That's our guide. This book is our only guide, not tradition. When you start to hear the word tradition, be very wary. Oh, there's something popped up. Hold on a second. It's giving me some technical advice. Okay. All right. So it was 1512, and as he began to study Paul's epistle to the Romans, that the verse for the gospel, a righteous, um, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So Martin Luther decided scripture alone, faith alone, grace alone. Look at that Bible thing's a monster. Have you ever seen the old Bibles that they, back in the day, they, you know, they were handwritten? They're huge. I'm so blessed to have this and not, not this, you know? <laughs> Martin Luther said, the Bible is alive. It speaks to me. It has feet. It runs after me. It has hands. It lays hold of me. And, you know, and this is the experience, you know, we were talking about in our class this morning that when you immerse yourself in the Word of God, all these truths start coming out to you, right? We, we're, as we're in our fundamental class talking about things old and things new, the Bible always has something new for you to learn, to discover. You just have to open your mind. Remember, our experience is not rigid. We don't find truth and stop. Our experience is fluid. We continue to move. This is like, I don't know if I mentioned this before, it's like an onion, right? It's layer after layer after layer. Martin Luther says, We believe that the very beginning and end of salvation and the sum of Christianity consists of faith in Christ, who by His blood alone and not by any works of ours has put away sin and destroyed the power of death. So Martin Luther is now moving away from a works-based salvation, which his church promoted, <coughs> to a faith-based worship. History of the Reformation. The just shall live by faith. These words that twice before had struck him like the voice of an angel from God resounded unceasingly and powerfully within him. But when by the Spirit of God I understood these words, when I had learnt how the justification of the sinner proceeds from the free mercy of our Lord through faith, then I felt born again like a new man. You know what? It must have been such a relief to know that it's not by what I do, right? Martin Luther said that he was the, the greatest monk that ever lived, right? He, he did everything by works, yet he wasn't he's satisfied. And then when he he realized that it's not anything that we do. You know, uh, he felt like a new man. I entered through the open doors into a very paradise of God. And you know, ultimately that's how we feel that, you know, we can't do anything. Salvation is a gift from God that you accept. Now, once we uh, decide that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, do we want to do things? Absolutely. We're compelled in our heart to share and to do good works, but that doesn't save us. Henceforward, also, I saw the beloved and holy scriptures with other eyes. I had perused the Bible. I brought together a great number of passages that taught me the nature of God's work. 
You know, we are to um, develop the principles that we live by um, precept by precept. And that's what Martin Luther did. He brought all these together uh, to help him in his walk. In Mark 7, 13, it says, Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. I don't know if you remember when I was talking in my testimony about um, the school on Ash Wednesday would put ash right on their forehead. And I wasn't a Christian at the time, and I was thinking that how ridiculous that is. And, you know, when I asked them, you know, why do you do that? It's tradition to do that. You know, we are not to, to live and to follow the traditions of men. We are to follow the Word of God. And more times than not, it's to, to the traditions that are followed and the Word of God is pushed aside. So ultimately for us, if it's not spoken of in here, we, we don't have to do it. It's not a requirement for us. So Martin Luther believed that salvation was gained through having faith in God. He called this idea justification by faith. So Martin Luther, he was allowed to, in his monastery, to study all these things and, and do it. And what he started to do is compare. What does the Bible say? And what does the church teach the people and force the people? And then we get to this. Martin Luther was also deeply troubled by the church's selling of indulgences, which he saw as false salvation. Is everybody familiar with indulgences? So indulgences, um, the Pope set a price for every sin. So you know how you have to confess your sins? Well, if you paid the church, you can get a certificate and your sins will be forgiven. So I guess gossip, maybe that costs $5. You know, stealing, maybe $30. Um, so they set a price for sin. And you pay and your sin would be forgiven. Who's forgiving these sins? It's the church. The church is forgiving you uh, of your sin. So obviously, do you think the church was making good money? Oh yeah, the money was rolling in. Because these poor people, you know... They, they didn't want, they wanted their sins forgiven because they didn't know about the justification that faith saves us. Jesus Christ forgives us, right? So he, he really didn't like this. And so he, that's where he started to form and put his 95 thesis. 95 is 95 things that he had a problem with, right? That's a lot. Now, this is the 1500s, do you think they still sell indulgences today? Yes. Wow. You, but we, everybody has the Bible. Everybody has the opportunity to read and know. But you're right. They do still sell indulgences. This year, uh, through November 20th, is the, the year of Jubilee, right? It started last year, goes through this year. The Jubilee year of mercy, enter the holy door, celebrate the Jubilee, and receive a, a plenary indulgence. And uh, I would like to share with you now um, an advertisement for that indulgence. Let's see if it'll work here. Jubilee year, Pope Francis has announced an indulgence that grants the full remission of all temporal punishment due to sin. A jubilee is a time of extraordinary forgiveness in the church, established by God and detailed in the Old Testament. During the jubilee year, sins and debts are forgiven. The Catholic Church forgives extraordinary sins, even abortion. The indulgence allows for the complete remission of all temporal punishment due to sin. To receive your indulgence, you will need to fulfill the obligations. Please look to the following. You must make a full and sincere confession, perform penance, receive Holy Communion, and pray for the intentions of the Holy Father. Finally, to obtain your indulgence, you must pass through a holy door. Holy doors are open in every diocese and in many key parishes. Each. Oh, that's okay. Hold on here. No, it's not going to play the whole thing. 
That's okay, Mark. Okay. I think they get the they get the gist. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they're, they're still selling it. There's things you have to do, um, you know, go through holy doors and, and, and do all these things. And you know, it's, you know, I, I laugh, but it's really a very sad thing when people believe that, that salvation comes through them paying. And did you hear who was forgiving all these things? It was the church. The church was forgiving. Even abortion. The church would forgive you. The Great Controversy, Chapter 7. The Pope had threatened Luther with excommunication, declaring the Reformers' final separation from the Roman Church. So, Martin Luther on October 31st, 1517, boom, up this goes, right? In the German language. So everybody in the town could come and read what the issue was. And that didn't make the, the papacy happy. Um, so it says, um, the reformer's final separation from the Roman church, denouncing him as accursed of heaven, and including in the same condemnation all who, who should receive his doctrines. So he cursed Martin Luther, and then he cursed all of you who read Martin Luther and agree with him. The great contest had been fully entered upon. So now Martin Luther had protested, right? I'm not going to do what the Catholic Church does. I'm going to protest everything that you stand for. It says, opposition is the lot of all whom God employs to present truths specially applicable to their time. Opposition. Does that happen to us today? When we are here presenting God's word in 2016, do we receive pushback? Absolutely. Just like Martin Luther had push back against him. But you know what? God employed Martin Luther to do this. God employs each and every one of us today to do our part to bring truth to the world. It says, There was a present truth in the days of Luther, a truth at that time of special importance. There is a present truth for the church today. And that's the three angels' message. We are to share with the world you know, this world is still buying indulgences. A relic, a dinosaur from the 15th century. There is a lot of darkness, and we are to be the light to that world. So Martin Luther was called. They asked him, you must recant. Recant is take back. Take back what you said, right? As parents, we tell our children, hey, take that back. So the Pope said, Martin Luther, you take back what you said. And what did Martin Luther say? Unless I am convinced by proofs from Scripture. Oh, right there. Right? What was leading and guiding his ideas? It was the Word of God. So he's saying, hey, unless I'm convinced by proofs from Scripture or by plain and clear reasons and arguments, I can and will not retract. For it is neither safe nor wise to do anything against conscience. So we must be firm in the Word of God that we will and cannot recant anything that the Bible teaches. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. So Martin Luther had drawn a line in the sand. He's not going to recant. He's not going to... He told them what they could do to change his mind. But can the church at that time rest on the Bible? No. They could only rest on their traditions. And traditions are not found in here. Traditions are made up by man. They're invented. So they could not risk, uh, rest on Scripture. So Martin Luther, he stood. And thus, he, the Protestant Reformation had began. Now, I want to share this with you. This is, this is a little shocking And uh, when I discovered this. So this area right here, this is where Martin Luther was. So this is talking about the Catholic Church. So... 70 to 100 percent, this is all the Roman Catholic area of Germany, okay? This is pre-World War II. So this area of Germany is all Protestants, all Protestants. So this was pre-World War II. So after World War II, Germany was divided into four parts. It was given to the Soviet Union, uh, England, America, and France. So here's how they divided it after World War II. 
So, the Protestant area was given to who? The Russians, the Soviet Union. What religion did the Soviet Union practice? Communism, atheism. They, they practiced no religion. The entire Protestant area was totally engulfed by the Soviet Union. Do you think the Soviet Union persecuted the Protestants? Oh, yeah. did they? And you know, I, I'm still trying, don't, I don't know history that well, but I'm still trying to wrap my mind around why America or England didn't take over the, the Protestant area. You know, does the Catholic Church maybe have influence on these powers? From, from our Daniel seminar, are we not learning that, you know, the little horn power controls these nations and kingdoms? Do you think this was the Roman Catholic Church kind of paying back what Luther did 400 years earlier? Oh, absolutely. This is from Wikipedia. Not the greatest source in the world, but it says, Most of the people in the territory of the German Democratic Republic were Protestants. Protestants suffered the ideological-based onslaught from the East German leadership, were attacked as outdated survivals of a feudal era to be replaced by the socialist man, communism. So they told them that they were outdated. Their faith was outdated. Had their institutions repressed and closed down, their communications censored, their social outreach diminished, and were made victims of the repressive secret police, the Stasi. So that, those Protestants in that area were basically under attack by the state. And they had to hold fast. Did the Protestant movement survive? Absolutely. What is our church? We're a Protestant church, right? So. John Morley says, you have not converted a man because you have silenced him. You know, we are to take the word of God and put it in our heart. And when it's in our heart, we are safe, right? They can take our Bibles, they can take our comfort, they can take everything. But if it's the word of God is in our heart, we are safe. I want to share with you um, a song that Martin Luther wrote. It's called, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And I was pleasantly surprised to find that it's in the Adventist hymnal. So he wrote this in 1529. The words and music Martin Luther translated from German to English by Frederick Hedge in 1853. This song has been called the greatest hymn of the greatest man of the greatest period of German history and the battle hymn of the Reformation. So I just want to go um, through some of the verses because as we know, hymns tell a story right? Hymns are a sermon to music. It's really an incredible thing. So let's just look at some of the lyrics. And then when we're done with this, I'd like to actually sing that song. Okay, well, don't get ahead of me, because I might have that in my <laughs> slide presentation. <laughs> All right, so it says, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing, our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. So, a mighty fortress is our God. It says, but the Lord has become my fortress